Good morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flanagan. I'm the assistant director here at the Southampton History Museum. Uh, this morning, we are joined by artist and photographer and Shinnecock resident Jeremy Dennis, who's going to give us a really great talk about uh, the Shinnecock history and some of the work that he does in his life. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy and we'll get started with the talk. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to submit those in the Q&A or the chat function below. We'll jump back in at the end and we'll go through any questions you might have. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Connor. And thanks everyone for joining. I see some um, new names in the attendee list. I see Nina. Hello, Nina. <laughs> um, and Akwe. Um, hello, everyone. Um, that's how we say hello in Algonquin or our Shinnecock language. Um, my name is Jeremy Dennis. I'm an artist and photographer from the Shinnecock Nation out in Southampton, New York. And um, I want to thank Connor again for giving this invitation because um, even though we're not there yet, uh, November is Native Heritage Month. And uh, just uh, factually, we don't have enough time that we dedicate to listening to Native voices, um, both historically and still today. And so I appreciate all of you um, coming today. So I want to talk for about 30 minutes on my various projects, including what you see on screen, a project called On This Site from 2016, which is a survey of Long Island's Native history. And so I'm going to start with a, uh, another map, actually. <laughs> this is by David Bun Martin. It was created in 1992. And as you can see, it displays the 13 tribes of Long Island um, from Carnarcee on the westernmost point, Montauk. And um, 13 is a uh, sort of an arbitrary number in a way, because uh, even though I'm Shinnecock, um, before the contact period, um, we didn't really have a name for who we were, and we were all related. And when the colonists first came, um, they asked who we were, we didn't have that. But we knew of the land we had a place for this area where we live and we called that Shinnecock. And so the um, English colonists in 1640 labeled us Shinnecock. And so I like to think that even though you can see that there's 13 tribes and we covered all, all of Long Island, um, Shinnecock and the Unkichogs are the only one with reservation today. And I always tell people that we always um, absorbed our neighboring tribes or didn't go extinct or vanish like uh, many common narratives. But I put a little blue star where the uh, territory is today for Shinnecock. Now, this is a photo I took of our uh, community center. So before I get into the project, I want to give a little background of common questions and answers. Um, we, uh, as a nation, received our federal recognition back in 2010, even though since 1792, we have been recognized as a formal government at Southampton Town and even have a trustee system that exists today from that point. And so we're a proud people that we say that we're the oldest self-governing tribe in the United States. And that 2010 moment actually formalized the government to government relationship with the federal government. So before it was just with the state and with Southampton, now it's with the entire country. But I like to think that even though we're only about 800 square acres of land and one mile north to south, I like to describe ourselves as a self-governing, a country within a country, and we have our own um, ways of living that are unique to our culture and ways of um, governing. And I really love this image as well, because on the uh, right side of this white building, this is our community center, is a mural by my mother, uh, Denise Silva Dennis. So she's an artist and I followed her footsteps. Um, this next slide is a Google Maps a satellite image of the territory. As you can see, it's surrounded by water on three sides on a peninsula. And my grandmother always said that we're still here because there was just nowhere else for us to be pushed back to. And so our land originally spanned from um, East Quag on the west side, including Riverhead, uh, Flanders, all the way over to Sag Harbor and Bridgehampton, and then it became Montaukett land. But this is the little sliver that we have today, and we're still fighting to regain that land. Now, this is our uh, tribal steel in our flag, and so you can see the, the very vibrant yellow. Yellow is a color that's on all Native American medicine wheels, and it typically represents the easternmost quadrant. 
and uh, yellow represents many good things. It represents the um, rising of the sun, hope for a new day, um, many things like that. Um, some people even call themselves the Dawnlands uh, people because we're on the East Coast. But as you can see on the bottom, we have two Atlantic right whales. We have the Shinnecock text that's in uh, something called wampum uh, style. So if you're unfamiliar with wampum, you really have to come to our powwow <laughs> uh, which is every Labor Day weekend. But if you uh, look around the jewelry stands or the artistry stands, you should look out for this um, white and purple bead. And so if you're someone who loves to walk the beach, you probably have seen these clamshells that have purple and white hues. On the left, we call those quahog shells, but today they're just clamshells. And on the right, um, for thousands of years, our people have turned this very delicate material into these um, beads. And so these beads became belts, they became necklaces, bracelets, anything you can imagine. And um, we've actually been creating um, an unfathomable amount of uh, beads over the years. But unfortunately, when um, I guess governments turned over or new administrations took the office, they would sometimes throw away these objects because they thought they might have been uh, jewelry or garbage, not knowing the significance. And so this next slide is the Haudenosaunee belt. This is the most famous example of, um, I believe, wampum jewelry that most Americans know. And so it represents the five nations of the Iroquois Confederacy in upstate New York. Um, this is a very important map for us here at Shinnecock. This represents um, our land, the Shinnecock Hills. And as you can see right in the middle, it says Shinnecock Tribe plus Indian Reserve. And this isn't our uh, map. This is a map by the county, by the state. And it basically is proof of our land as it should be today. But I put it a little rectangle, the green rectangle on the bottom right, which represents the present day land. And so as you can see, um, if you take the Long Island Railroad often, um, you can see it's absent from this map. And so in 1859, um, the land was finally um, stolen from us through theft, um, forgery of signatures and many other things by Southampton proprietors. And um, not only that, but um, according to the United States Congress, it was illegal for uh, individuals to actually um, outright purchase uh, directly from Indian nations. So this um, exchange or this transaction was actually illegal and void. So for some reason today, um, this truth, this injustice has not been recognized, but we still fight for it today. Um, this next image goes back to 2010 when we finally got our federal recognition. This is my mom in the, um, on the right side, and this is my aunt Darlene on the left side, and they're both uh, wearing traditional regalia. As you can see on the right, my mom's wearing a pendant of the Shinnecock flag along with a crown. And on the left, my um, aunt is wearing a ribbon shirt with a, a box turtle adorned on the a blanket and clothing. And so this next uh, slide is just a, a really impressive map of not even all of the 500 plus nations that share this federal recognition title. And so it's really um, amazing to think about like, how dense was uh, the America before the contact period, along with the wars, the famine, the um, Trail of Tears, and many other atrocities. Um, they, some estimates range from 10,000, or uh, rather uh, 10 million to 90 million indigenous peoples just in what is the United States alone before the contact period. And now that number um, I guess according to demographics represents 2% of our nation's population. So it's a very dramatic drop since this point. But as you can see, there was really nowhere in the country that was just empty or that tabula rasa or new world that we like to think of it as. And so here at Shinnecock, we're probably most known for our annual powwow. This is a photo I took up on the stage. And if you've ever been, you know that our stage is eight feet off the ground. It's a special privilege to be up on the stage. And I love this photo so much because it looks like it could be any time period, which is really magical to me. 
And so I'm going to uh, focus mostly on my project called On This Site, Indigenous Long Islands. But there are other portrait projects that you can check out on my website. Before I get into On This Site, I have another mapping project that I really enjoy. And it's simply called uh, Shinnecock Portraits. And so these are three different um, tribal members. This is uh, Brian Polite, our chairman, uh, Shanae Bullock, who's doing the medical marijuana dispensary work, and my godfather, uh, Keith Phillips, on the right. And this is a project that comes out of a legacy of being proud of who we are, being uh, documented as a still resilient and existing people. And so on the left, we have one of my ancestors, Lois Noadana, um, or a Princess Noadana. Her name was uh, Lois Hunter. That's her birth name. But some of the older people in Southampton still remember her and her wearing this a white dress made of leather <laughs> pretty much all the time in public. So she was a celebrity in her own right. And on the right is uh, Mary Rebecca Bunn Lee who um, anthropologists often came out and photographed her and made her famous in her own right as well. And so being Shinnecock, being a photographer, I wanted to continue this proud um, tradition of documenting ourselves, telling our stories, and making sure people know that we're still here as a people. And so I love looking at Google Maps at the same time. And what we're looking at on screen is something called Google Street View. And so if you've ever um, wanted to explore the world or see what a neighborhood looks like before you travel there, you have this little um, orange guy that you can drag onto the map of Google Maps, and it gives you that 360 uh, panorama. But if you look at the Shinnecock Nation, it's actually um, completely void of any information, any data. And so to me, and as an artist, that became a interesting um, contrast because we still think of photography as providing documentation today. And to me, just having no information kind of represents that historical narrative that nothing's there, there's nothing to see, um, no people or culture. And so as a um, artist and being able to upload your own images to this platform, I did a traditional portrait as part of this project of different tribal members. I did a 360 panoramic image of them as well. So if you go to that area on Google Maps, you can see this image on the right. And I also did a um, interview. And so this is eventually going to be a podcast. It'll be transcribed. And it's already been shown in different exhibits, including, um, I guess, traditional galleries, museums, and even uh, high schools in the city of the exhibit. And so turning to my On This Day project, I wanted to mention that in uh, 2016, I began the series of site-specific photos and landscapes throughout Long Island, New York. And for um, my own experience and upbringing, it was really a, a sad um, realization that maybe when I was 26, 27, I realized I didn't really have any formal education or awareness around my own history. Um, I think in maybe fourth grade, you learn about social studies, classes telling you about the Wampanoag, if you're lucky, and the um, Thanksgiving holiday. I know it's improved today, but that was my <laughs> own um, upbringing and what I remember. But I wanted to share a couple of stats from a 2015 study by Penn State University, which found that 87% of content taught about Native Americans is only a pre-1900 context. And so in other words, um, in our public education system, we're routinely told and taught that Native people only exist in the past, they're a static culture, anything that exists today is either um, too mixed blood, they're no longer here, or there's nothing to teach about them. Uh, another study actually um, revealed that two-thirds of people don't know an actual a living Native person and their social life or social circles, and I believe that 30% um, of people um, don't even know that Native people still exist. And so this next slide is sort of a representation of that. Um, not only in our history of classes are we told this, but also in popular culture. And so these are a couple of different newspaper clippings and different books. Um, this is in a similar vein of The Last of the Mohegans, which was a 
um, major Hollywood hit. I think it was probably maybe except for Pocahontas, the biggest Native American um, film. But it is centering on that story of a vanishing race. We have to save them. There's nothing we can do except watch them perish. But at least in this area of the country, um, for the Shinnecock and the Montaukets, every time there was an obituary, they couldn't just say um, this person died. They had to say that this was the last of the tribe. And this would happen um, over and over until it was hammered into his mind. And so if you go back to the website and the project, you can actually click on different icons and shapes on the map. And it'll bring you up to this Wikipedia style uh, format. And so since I'm uh, from Shinnecock, this is a um, example from that little dot. And it's really a um, way of just engaging at your own pace or looking at different categories at your own time. I don't think that um, for, for some people, it's just a drop in the bucket in terms of starting out and learning all of this history. But for me, it's the process of finally learning it, sharing as much as possible. And for the first time ever, making these old, um, sometimes dusty books in libraries and archives, um, searchable on Google and free to access, which is incredible. And so a lot of the time I'm just out <laughs> with my camera, crawling through the woods. Sometimes you have to trust fast to go back to your ancestral site. So this is me, as you can see, standing in a couple inches of water for that photo. And a lot of the sites are, um, they, I think historians know where they exist, but there's just a slight description of them. There's a really great book by William Wallace Tucker called Indian Place Names of Long Island. And it has, I believe, um, over 300 or so um, place names. And so these are names that are in the Algonquin language. They're pretty much described in maybe 18th century descriptions. So a lot of these places are either demolished or they're no longer there. They could have been renamed as roads or they could be so vaguely described that it's almost impossible to find them today. But, it, but a lot of them at the same time are only descriptions of uh, deeds. And so um, they lose a lot of their significance and their translations. But I think it's um, in, incredible that if we map all of this out, if we find out where they're located, I think a lot of them represent um, the biodiversity of that site, the way it was used environmentally, um, who once lived there. A lot of them are actually named after the um, indigenous people or individuals who live there as well. So there's just hundreds of examples of this. And so if you're not a fan of the um, internet or technology, this project is also available as a book on the left and also as a traveling exhibit. And so the first ever exhibit I had was at the Shinnecock Cultural Center and Museum followed by the Suffolk County Historical Society in Riverhead. And so I'm always looking for different venues to share this history. And now I want to just share some of the interesting facts that I've come across. Um, one thing that opened up my mind as to the scale of history and culture in this area is this uh, Clov uh, Clovis projectile point. And so I've always wondered uh, growing up, how long have we been here as a people? How long is the land been here? And so if you um, research that, um, most experts agree that Long Island was formed about 15,000 years ago by a glacier movement. And we as Shinnecock people have been here for more than 10,000 years, thanks to the evidence of these uh, Clovis points. And so on the left, this is probably somewhere on the mainland, maybe um, in upstate New York, because it's a cave structure, but it's very similar to how we used to um, live and bury our ancestors. But I think it's incredible, that timeline, <laughs> and thinking how long we've been here, how much is in the landscape uh, culturally. Um, a lot of the project also brings up difficult histories of Indian removal, assimilation, um, and sharing basic stories about how we got here but never really learned. And so we like to think of uh, ourselves as um, or I should say, we like to think of Native people as um, poor sometimes. We like to think of them as um, kind of sad and um, not being able to thrive. But if you look at the history of Native people, there's many reasons outside of their own decisions and circumstance that made that happen. 
And so the uh, Cherokee people and the Indian Removal Act of 1830 is a good example of that, because even though the Cherokee um, turn their oral language into a written language, and even though they all converted to Christianity, they were still forcefully removed from their land. And as we all know, the uh, southern states where they once lived and thrived was uh, turned into the cotton and tobacco um, areas where the um, southern states um, finally um, took their land for free, basically, and made a lot of money at that point. Um, I also want to show you something called show middens because um, if you were following the news, you heard about the great news about Sugarloaf Hill. This is probably our most important cultural site in all of um, Long Island because it is a 3,000-year-old uh, burial site that was finally preserved after 30 years. And I thought that when I started the project on this site, I would have maybe seven of these sites. I would monitor them, maybe show a little bit of context around them. But then I came across these shell midden uh, sites by archaeologists. And on the left, now this is the photo I took at the Peapot Museum in Connecticut. Um, you have to visit if you've never been. But in this one scene, um, a woman is basically uh, reenacting what villages uh, all over Long Island and New England once did. Um, we would basically have a rich diet of oysters, clam, mussels, and other sea fish. And we would put all the um, really sharp shells into a communal pile. And so wherever there was a major village, um, you would find these shell middens. And so on the right, um, we we have the famous uh, Shinnecock Hills Golf Club, and even there, there's a huge uh, shell needle um, taken in this photo. And so I hope that as the project goes on, I'll be able to map all these different shell midden sites and show people that no matter where you live, no matter where you look, um, Native people live there, thrive there, and have memories there. Uh, this is a, a site um, called Ashwag that not only has a preserved Algonquin name, but it has a rich history of uh, shell middens and wigwams. And so even during the uh, history, historic period or the early contact period, historians uh, described more than 40 wigwams uh, being along the shoreline of Ashwag. And along this um, body of water, which is three miles, uh, three mile harbor today, they're said that um, there are two feet in elevation shell middens of along the coastline. And so it's just incredible to think about the amount of people, the histories of this place, and how rich it is. Uh, this is a, a similar site to Sugarloaf Hill. This is called the Hawthorne site. And it became a historic site for Shinnecock back in 2018 around our uh, powwow, because as a developer was building in the Shinnecock Hills, they came across a, a human remain um, a human skull along with a, a bottle. And as you can see, there's an um, excavator on the hill and there's an excavator building a foundation. And the uh, one in the foundation stopped right where it came across the human remains. And so this isn't the exact um, bottle itself. This is one that's at the Smithsonian um, collection. But you can see it has the inscription of uh, Wobotown, which is a name of one of the um, on top it ancestors who were buried in East Hampton. And unfortunately their grave was um, desecrated and built upon. And we uh, usually frown upon having um, objects removed and housed in these collections because for us native people, um, sometimes like the, um, I think the pharaohs are a good, good example of uh, being buried with things that you need in the afterlife or your favorite objects. We had a very similar uh, tradition. And so um, a lot of our most elevated and respected um, community members were whalers. They had um, different coats, different objects like this glass bottle that were rare and um, proud possession. And so when they died, they wanted to be buried with them. And so it's a little bit messed up that <laughs> uh, the Smithsonian has it in their collection today. And there's photos of it and there's still awaiting uh, repatriation, which is returning the topic to the grave site. And so um, when I was there at the Hawthorne site, they, um, the detectives showed us this bottle and I recognized it immediately from this project. 
And so I feel like if I didn't start this project and didn't do the research, it might have just been dismissed as a um, random case and we might have lost all um, uh, eligibility to save our ancestor. And so uh, this is a um, GoFundMe campaign that we had to do to preserve the site and return our ancestor to the ground. And the um, horrible thing about this history is that, um, as I mentioned before, in 1859, the Shinnecock Hills was stolen from us without any compensation, without any um, reconciliation. And so um, when we wanted to return our ancestor to the ground, um, Southampton asked us to uh, fundraise at first $400,000, and then they lowered it to $50,000. But this is the town that generates more than $20 million each year passively through the Community Preservation Fund and real estate sales. And so it's really horrible that we as Shinnecock people who sometimes have a median family income of 10,000 um, are asked to do this. And so I put a little um, blue star where the Hawthorne site is. And just to the right, you can see Sugarloaf Hill. And that was finally uh, preserved, as you can see in this image. And so in uh, more recent years, I've been doing um, more drone photography. And this is beneficial because, um, especially in the spring and the summer, everything is so overgrown, you can't see some things in context. Um, Long Island is so flat that you can't really um, identify these sites as well in context. And also there's a lot of uh, private sites. That's something that we never had as indigenous people, just private lands or fenced off areas. And so a drone is really essential to regain access to a lot of these sites and check in on them. This is a uh, aerial image of Sugarloaf Hill with a mansion that's um, now destroyed. And so, um, as I mentioned before, Sugarloaf Hill is 3,000 years old or more. And on this next slide, I'm sure some people <laughs> um, in the room or in Southampton love and hate this um, structure. <laughs> this is the Shinnecock Monument on the uh, Montauk Highway, right in Hampton Bays. And for us, um, this is an economic development um, project where tribal members um, rent out at ad space while also having a monument to Shinnecock on the So um, all day long and all night long there's a seal of our flag on the top and it's back at night and in the center there's different ads that um, businesses um, advertise and generate money for our pot holes, sometimes for our jobs, uh, child care, and other things. And so um, even today, the Department of Transportation and the New York governor are still um, uh, suing trustees over this project. And so we're um, kind of uh, at a net loss because of that. And so if you're um, maybe zooming in outside of the Hamptons, you might get a sense that um, this is just a party area, it's just for the beaches, and there's a lot of wealth out here. But, uh, but for us at Shinnecock, we try to um, live in balance with the land as our ancestors uh, once did. And this is a, a site called The Point on the southern tip of the territory. And so even if you go on Google Maps today, you'll see it's a lot of marshland, a lot of green land. There's just so much biodiversity, which is um, incredible. And then this is a, a cropped image. So um, as you can see in our side of the water, it's uh, um, all natural. And then we see the mansions that are built on top of each other, right up to the water's edge. And so um, a lot of Shinnecock people say that um, we have to look at their big mansions and then they get a beautiful natural view on the other side, which is uh, unfair. And so um, this is the to-do list for the project. It spans all of Long Island from Brooklyn to Montauk. And all of these websites are different places that I know exist, but I have to go out and find. And the uh, blue and green are actually available on the website now. So if you go to jeremynative.com slash on this site, 
you'll be able to learn about these sites for free. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project that came out of on this site. And it was the first time I attended a artist residency, which if you're unfamiliar, it's a retreat for artists to get away from the daily stresses of life, be offered a space to work, to think, and have materials like um, boundaries, ceramic wheels, things like that. As I was leaving home, I went up to Johnson, Vermont, and went to Vermont Studio Center for a whole month. And I didn't really have access to the landscape and the landscape work I was doing. And so I created a body of work called Nothing Happens Here as a response to my own work, because as I said, it's just so shocking to live in Southampton and not learn very much about Shinnecock. And um, just as I'm taught uh, when I was in middle school and elementary school, that nothing happened here before the founding of town or 1640, I created this body of portrait of images and uh, por uh, portraits of people um, being shot by arrows and suggesting that nothing happened here. And it's not really a violent um, theory. As you can look on this um, individual's face, he's not really in pain. It's more the pain of um, this burden of knowing something vaguely and not really resolving it. And so I think that not only do Native people suffer from this trauma, it's a, a shared trauma. And so sometimes I think about what we have accomplished as a nation, and yet at the same time, it's all built on the foundation of um, colonization by Native people or of Native people and slavery of um, African people. And so there's another series I'm showing called Rise. This is a self-portrait project that um, really shows myself um, in traditional regalia. And of course, this wig, a very short hair today. <laughs> and it's um, kind of pulling at the um, popular culture of zombie movies. And in zombie movies, we all know of the undead or haunting the living. And in this body of work, it's sort of the vanished race, which never really vanished, coming back and haunting the living um, by returning to their ancestral lands. And for us at Shinnecock, this could be like the Shinnecock Hills. But um, even though there's 500 plus Native nations in the United States, we each are so unique. But one thing that, that unites us is the um, broken treaties that, that we have suffered from the United States. So we do have a lot of land that should belong to Native people, but still outside of our stewardship. Uh, one last project I want to share is called um, Ma's House, and this is here on the Shinnecock Nation. And so this is me and my sister on the left, and this is Ma's House um, on the right. And what we're doing at Ma's House is creating this communal art space for artists of color to heal, to create, to come for two weeks at a time. Um, some of you might recognize this individual on the left, which is uh, Shane Weeks. We proudly had him um, come and do a couple of different history workshops. And so it's a dedicated space for culture, for art, and it's here on the uh, Shinnecock Nation territory. And it's really um, in the spirit of the powwow. Uh, excuse me. So um, the powwow is only four days out of the year, but what do we do the rest of that year um, when people want to engage, when people want to support Shinnecock and interact? And so this is the space that's up in year round for these type of uh, events. I really hope that the on the site project will also have a physical space on the walls of Moss House. So not only is there contemporary art, there's also personal art that celebrates our history as well. And this is a um, before and after image of some of the renovation we had to do. And so um, it's been vacant for about five years now. And so on the left is the before image, and on the right is the uh, residency room that we dedicate to artists of color. And so this is the website if you want to learn more. It's um, mozhouse.studio. And then on this next slide, this is the very last slide. Um, if you want to get in touch, this is um, different ways that you can, can uh, contact me. But I want to thank you all for your time and 
Um, maybe we'll see if there's any questions in the chat. But thanks so much for listening. All right, thanks, Jeremy. Um, it's still always weird with these Zoom talks. You don't get those little play claps after uh, after these talks finish. But um, but yeah, we have a few questions. Um, uh, the first one that we have here is somebody asking, does the Shinnecock Nation support the Montaukett uh, recognition bill? This is a funny um, issue because if you know um, a lot of Long Island's Native history, you know that the Montaukets and Wyandanche had such a um, deep impact on land transactions and um, ways that the settlers first uh, settled here. He kind of guided them and had that kind of control. And so it's really an injustice and an irony that the Shinnecock is recognized, but the Montaukett aren't. And we really are um, kind of sister nations. And so we do definitely want the Montaukets to be both state and federally recognized. And it's been too long that they haven't. And um, Katie, you might know the um, horrible thing that happened to the Montaukets. I think it was in 1902 um, or 1911, around that time. But they went into the uh, Pacific County ports. Um, they went in for their recognition to finally go through. And when 50 of the tribal members were there in the court in person, um, the judge declared them extinct as a tribe. And this is something that um, still is recognized today as a decision, and it's entirely based on a racism. And so some tribes have something called blood quantum. This is a system of um, control by the federal government that states that if your blood is too mixed, you're no longer eligible to be an enrolled member. Luckily, we don't have to do that here on the Northeast. East, but um, some some uh, governments don't recognize Native people because they're too uh, black passing or they're too mixed race, and there's really no other um, race that has that issue. Like you don't go to um, other Americans and say you're not American because you're too white or you're too black. That's unique to us. Um, that racism racism that exists. So thank you for uh, asking. Um, we have another question. Uh, have any walking trails been established on Sugarloaf Hill? Oh, thanks for asking that, uh, Katie. Um, Sugarloaf Hill is interesting because there used to be a huge, I would say, like four or 5,000 square foot mansion on top of it, um, right on top of the burial site. And that was demolished. Um, the plan is, is that that land will eventually become Shinnecock land. And we will use it for different ceremonies. And so I think the thing that will end up happening is it will be by invitation only. We will observe ceremonies up there and remember our ancestors and try to protect it from a future desecration. Um, I would say in terms of hiking, um, out in Montauk and Napi are probably the most beautiful areas. And even though there's no historic signs, there's no um, I guess reservation out there. There is a lot of um, history and historic sites. And so I hope to um, incorporate that in my project in the future. Uh, a question I had was, um, do you have anything uh, coming up over at Ma's house that you may want to talk about? I don't know if there's a new artist coming in soon or a new project you guys are working on that you wanted to uh, sort of plug or share about. Oh, sure. Um, we do have weekly workshops. And so that's something that um, we invite the public for, and we also have a lot of um, <laughs> questions around because sometimes we're teaching native feed work, and the public sometimes feels uncomfortable about um, participating in fears of appropriation. But this is really a way that you can engage with native culture, uh, native culture in a sensitive way. And so we do different workshops from feed work. We did one around mask making. We did one around um, ceramic yesterday. And so it's every Friday from 5 to 8 p.m. You just have to do RSVP. And so we have a contact page on our website. We're on uh, social media if you want to RSVP that way. We also have a beadwork exhibition on, uh, on view until November 12th, and that's open by appointment. And the last public event that we have coming up that we will at all RSVP for is a uh, film screening event as a benefit from Oz House. It's going to be November 13th 
um, by the 7 p.m. And it's in partnership with Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor. And so there's going to be seven native directed films. Moss House is concluded for uh, seven minutes each. And they're different storytelling uh, films, uh, documentaries, part of the uh, reciprocity project. So I hope you all um, attend that. Um, you can go to our website. And I think the tickets are uh, $15 each. Yeah, that all sounds great. Um, for everybody, I just put in the chat, um, and also Jeremy did too, I think, uh, the link for Moz House website, mozhouse.studio, where you can find links for all those programs that he was talking about. Um, and I also put a link to uh, jeremynative.com uh, slash on the site. Uh, so you can check those out and see the map that he was talking about before. It's interactive. You can zoom in on it and um, everything else he has on his website. Um, I'll also put those in the description for the YouTube video for anybody watching later. Uh, so you have, you can check out everything that we talked about today. Um, unless we have any other questions that pop in right now, um, I want to thank you, Jeremy, for joining us this morning, uh, giving us this really great talk, um, shedding a little insight into uh, Shinnecock history from your perspective um, and, and getting, you know, real genuine thoughts and ideas about this. Um, yeah, another question came in more of a, a thank you. Another thank you, Jeremy, from the uh, from the audience. Um, and yeah, I definitely want to encourage everybody to mm -hmm. check out Ma's house and uh, donate, um, show up to the programs, and uh, get involved. Yeah. Well, thank you, Connor. Thanks everyone for attending. I hope this is the first of all of our connections and partnerships, and hope to see you all in person, safe and without COVID. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, thank you again, everybody, and we will see you all next time. Have a good rest of your day.